So one of the, the viewers asked me last week after our session to do a, a segment on how to improve your worst piece. I guess there's some subtext to this question, how do we improve our worst piece? There's There are some questions that are promoted by Jacob Agard, uh, Ogard. So he, he suggests that you ask three questions in any position that you're playing. I, I guess more so in strategic positions, because when there's a tactic, you just have to calculate and find it. But in a position where you're not completely sure what's going on, you can get really familiar uh, very easily using some questions. So one question is, what is your worst place piece? What is your opponent's worst place piece? So this is really good. And we're going to talk just about this one question. If you want to learn more, definitely buy uh, Ogard's books. He goes into these things in detail over the course of several uh, very good books. I've only read a couple of them, and not completely. I'm working my way through them right now. So I think when people say, how do you improve your worst piece? It's probably because they've heard through the grapevine this method where people are using this catchphrase, which is very useful for remembering to just talk to your pieces, figure out how they're doing and what they would like to be doing. But this is a hard question to ask when you are a very novice player, or even if you are just sort of unacquainted with how people think about chess. Maybe you've never read a chess book. So let's break it down first into how do we know if our pieces are in a good place or not? All right, let me just change this real quick. I didn't mean to give a typing, typing lesson, but anyway. So let's start with just two kings on the board. I know this is boring. This is already a draw by insufficient material. But let's just look at the kings as pieces, not as necessarily the object of the game. Let's just think about what they are, where they are, and how they move, and try to derive some principles from this. So if we look at the two kings, we see that they always control eight squares in the center, and they would control uh, fewer places from other positions. <laughs> Jake's funny as always. He said, both kings are well placed for an endgame. White is slightly better. <laughs> Love it. And white has the move, which is even more advantageous, right? Actually, let me just run... Actually, I can't run with these pieces. Because the game's technically already over. But if we put the one king in the corner and one king in the center, we see one king controls eight. And if a king was in the corner, it would control just three not including the square it stands on. So this is already interesting. Pieces don't attack the square they stand on. This is probably contrary to intuition. People think I control a spot if I stand on that spot. Like we're playing baseball or something. If you stand on a base, you control the base. But not necessarily true. Um, and we can also see by comparing these two possible positions of the kings that, let, just to be very clear, let's pretend this king's over there. Um, we can see that when the king is centralized, the king controls more squares. So we could use the number of squares that are controlled as kind of a proxy for activity, at least in like the average position. In some positions, it's obvious that certain squares could become critical. We've already talked about the criticality of some squares in our strategy lesson on the Stonewall defense and things like that. So some particular squares could be really important, in which case the, the relative values of the pieces kind of vanish. Whatever piece can control the spot, that's helpful if that square is really important. But if we're talking generally, controlling more squares is good. It increases your chances that you could reach an important square in time because you'll have more ways to try to approach that spot. And it also means that you're more likely to control an important square. So this is kind of the basis of the idea of peace activity, which I've also talked about a lot. Um, so hold on, how do I get this thing to unhighlight? Anyway. So we, we've talked about that a little bit. So this is how we can start talking about activity. I'd also like to suggest something that's really weird. This is not from any book that I've read or I haven't like had this passed on to me from some, some other player. I think that it's kind of valuable to look at the pieces as field phenomena. If anyone uh, watching is familiar with physics, you can think of uh, particles not just as an actual thing that you can hold in your hand. You can also think of it as a field. And to put it in a simple way, you can think of it as it, how it influences the things around it. That's basically how it manifests in the world. 
So we could think of each piece as kind of a field. So we could look at this king as an area of control, which is a square. And of course, when pieces reach the boundaries of the board, some of their control vanishes. So they're usually more effective towards the center, but this is not true for all pieces. To think about a piece's relationship with the center, it makes sense to consider their range. Generally, short range pieces benefit more from being the center. So that means kings, pawns, knights. Those are the short range pieces. So this is already kind of interesting. We can think about how active pieces are based on where they are just on the board. I didn't even put any other pieces. And we can also kind of begin to imagine how the, the pieces interact with each other by looking at this exact position. We can see that if there are two kings, actually, um, let me do the colors a little differently. If I can remember how to do a color, okay. So these two squares are mutually controlled. All right, I accidentally made them go away. They're controlled by the same piece. I'm terrible at this. Okay. <laughs> I don't know why I'm struggling today. I just did a bunch of wrong clicks. Okay. Not struggling anymore. Okay, so as you guys can see, two of these squares are contested squares. So you can see this is a, an interaction between these two kings, between their fields. And this could impact their activity or their value. Hey, Headshot Roman. By the way, thanks for the raid. I added you to my auto host list. So hopefully you'll be seeing some, some extra traffic from my end. Anyway, um, so continuing to talk about this. Hold on. This is a little weird. Okay, there we go. So anyway, there's kind of an interaction between these pieces. We can see activity in this way. It's an interaction between pieces. It's an interaction between pieces and the board. I think one of the major breakthroughs for myself when I was a beginner was when I realized the importance of squares, not just pieces. I think there's a psychological tendency to focus so much on the moving parts of the chessboard and to kind of take for granted the field that they fight on. The board is actually very important and also the pieces they relate to the board, like being in the corner, not so good, being the center, often better. Um, Let's also talk about what pieces can do in two moves. So if I just take an example for one king and I want to move the king two steps, um, for example, here, I can go straight there. I can go, let's see, I could take three steps to go here, three steps to go here. Um, I could go three steps in this way. I was going to say two, but you know, I'm just trying to show that there's a variety of ways that the king can reach the same square often in the same number of moves. The fastest path here is directly down the middle, as in real life, but sometimes for a longer path, um, you can surprisingly get to the same place in multiple moves in, uh, I'm sorry, in the same number of moves in multiple ways. So if I wanted to go all the way over here, I could go like this and like this, and this is all the same distance. So this is kind of like the long-term influence of the king. So we're going to move on to the other pieces and hopefully my thesis will be clear later on. Jake has a good suggestion that the contested squares should be green because blue and yellow make green. Um, blue and yellow only make green in light, right? In paint, they don't. And I'm already butchering the, the squares and colors anyway, so I'm just going to avoid doing any kind of sensible things. So here's two pawns, which is also nonsense. Um, but let's talk about their influence on the board, just on the squares, how they can travel from A to B, and try to derive some principles from this too. So this pawn on the second rank, it can actually reach a variety of places. It can go here in two moves. It can go here in two moves. It can go, if it captures things, like let's pretend there were other pieces around, it could go like this. And also, I guess, technically reach here in two moves. That's interesting. I didn't think of that earlier. Um, and we can also see that it can come ahead like this in, in multiple moves. Um, let's see. Can I... Oh, <laughs> I'm so bad at this. But you guys can see that the pawn actually has a variety of places to go from here. But this pawn doesn't have as many. In two moves, it can go here and here and here, assuming that there are also things to capture. So... We can see that this short range piece, it has fewer liberties on the edge of the board. We can also see that the pawn is really a slow moving piece. The king is way more flexible. 
right? The king, we see it can go in any direction it wants. So if there's an important square here, the king can eventually reach it. If there's an important square here, the king can eventually reach it. In fact, quite quickly compared to some pieces. But for the pawns, it's not really like that. If there's an important square here, good luck for this pawn. The only way that the, uh, the black pawn is going to ever reach h1 is if it promotes to a queen, which is probably the most important thing uh, that the pawn can do long term to increase its activity. But this is kind of a nonlinearity. The, the activity of the pawn, it increases sharply as it uh, approaches the eighth rank. So we, if we're just talking about its general activity in the rest of the board, it's limited in this way. In the center, it has um, like a third more options because it can attack in two different directions. And if it's on the second rank, it also has an additional possibility of go going further. So the pawn is most active on the second rank, something we can derive right away from these basic observations. Um, but it's also really important to note that the pawn is super slow. Okay, the pawn is not able to reach certain important areas of the board. And so the way that we should interact with the pawns, it, it will become more obvious as we go. So let's, let's go to the knights. Okay, so I've already placed these knights in a suggestive way. This knight controls eight places, has eight liberties. And this is a maximum. So the knight's control is almost a constant. It's only diminished by going near the edge of the board. Here, it's only able to go on two places. If it was somewhere else, it might be three, four, or six squares. But it's never going to control fully eight if it's not within, uh, let me see, this box. Let me get rid of some arrows for you guys. All right, maybe I'll just make it a different color arrow. Sorry, I'm bad at this box. If it's in this box, it will control eight. Within, like on or within these blue arrows. If it's outside, like if it's um, here, then it's going to control, I guess, six. If it's on the edge, it will be three or two. So not that much. I guess also um, four. Like in the corner, it's two. Here, it's three. And here, it's four. So to be even more suggestive, it will be four on these lines. I hope I'm not butchering this. I'm not really great at counting, just for the record. So this is all a pretty picture. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of getting at my point fast, so please bear with me, okay? Um, the knights have some unusual issues with jumping. Um, for one thing, if they want to go to an adjacent square, it's quite difficult. This is in sh uh, sharp contrast with the king. The king is super flexible. He's just also super slow. But the knight, it's kind of fast, but only going to certain areas of the board. This is part of why the knight is such a weird, charismatic piece. Um, so if I want to go to an adjacent square, um, maybe an or to be precise, an orthogonal square, one of these, um, it would take me like three moves, right? Um, I would go like, hold on, let me get rid of these arrows before I make myself dizzy. So if I wanted to go here, um, it would take me three moves maximum. I'm sorry, not maximum. Like this is the only number of moves that it will take uh, unless you're going through some really inefficient route. And to go to a square that's diagonal, like this one, it would be one, two. To go to a square that's um, not adjacent, but also the opposite color, it's one, as we can see from just like any observation of the knights like this one. Um, and to get to some faraway squares, sometimes it takes really a long time, sometimes it takes a really short time. This is an odd thing about knights. Um, but there's another interesting thing, because knights jump, they're kind of, uh, they don't interact as strongly with the other pieces. So that's why they are sometimes surprisingly fast, even though they are not able to cross the board in this way. I mean, not in the way of a long range piece. Okay, so let's talk about bishops. Bishops control, I guess, 13 squares minimum. No, 13 squares maximum. Like, here's 13. That's 7. That's 6. Total 13. And this other bishop is controlling just 6. So that's the minimum that it can do. And in two moves, they can cover the whole board, but only half of it, right? So they can go anywhere in the whole place as long as it's on their color. So these are strongly interacting specifically on a certain complex of squares. 
Now, the, the rook is really interesting because the rook just controls 14 squares on an open board. The only time the rook controls fewer than 14 is when there are contesting pieces that limit its field. As you can see, they control the same number of squares, even though they are in totally different kinds of places. So rooks are generally efficient, and they're also not color limited. So they're strongly interacting with all squares on the board in like just a short number of moves. In two, in two moves, they can go to any square on an open board. The queen is even better because it can control 27 squares and it has all the flexibility of the, the rook. But it's also interesting to note that whatever color it's on, it has a strong bias towards that color. It's going to strongly control that color just like a bishop. So we can think of queens kind of like bishops in, in that they, like if it's a dark color queen, it's going to control all the dark squares a lot more. And if it's a light colored queen, then it's going to control the light squares a lot more. The reason we don't think about this so much is probably because the queens are so dynamic. They're so, like, they interact so much with the board, they can go anywhere they want in two moves in a variety of ways, not just two ways, um, that we don't really think about the static feature of a queen on one color that much. But it's actually very important. When the queens are on the same color as each other, it's kind of like you have a, a single color, I mean, a, a same color bishop situation where the bishops are competing with each other. But when the queens are on the opposite color, it's like an opposite color bishop situation where they're not competing with each other, they're not interacting, at least until they switch to a new color. So these are kind of some interesting observations, in my opinion, and it helped me to think about these a lot as a beginner, um, at least just to familiarize myself with the pieces, but it helped me develop a combinative vision that I think is really uh, my strongest suit, I suppose. And Jake, I don't think I would consider it like a fast king that much. I think it's important to actually de uh, demarcate between all of them. Because in some sense, we, we could reduce all pieces uh, too much to a simple state of just saying, these are all just like faster, slow versions of one other piece. So if we want to characterize them, it's good to keep them separate. Um, and I also have a thesis about this coming up. But first, I want to make a couple observations. So to accomplish a particular task, like to attack a certain square, the king can have several ways to do it. Like let's pretend the white king wants to attack this square. It can do it in three different ways. This is actually a lot of flexibility. You'll see when I, when I do this for the other pieces. Having three ways to do the same thing increases your likelihood of success if this is an important goal. I just picked a random square just to illustrate, but in, in the games that I'm going to show you later, it'll probably make sense that having multiple ways is very valuable. If we just talk about these pawns, we can see that um, to reach a particular square, they're very limited. The reason is that like usually captures are not available. So if I wanted to go to e4 with this pawn, I have two ways, uh, just direct moving. Like I could go in one step or I could go in two steps. If I could capture, I could do it like this, but this is extremely unlikely that I could take two pieces in a row. However, it does turn out to be relevant in some very dy uh, dynamic positions where the pieces are interacting a lot. So it has technically, let's see, one, two, three, four paths to reach the same square. This pawn doesn't have that same luxury. To reach a square that's two in front of it, it can go one way, two ways. And one of those ways is extremely unlikely. So having more liberties is generally better. So this also tells us something about the placement of the pawn. It also tells us about its maximum capability. It's never going to have more paths than this. It's just not possible. For the knight, if we want to pick a square for our knight, like let's say I want my white knight to go to a4. I could play knight c5 to a4, and I could play knight c3 to a4. These are the two shortest paths, and there's uniquely two of them. There's not going to be ever three or some other weird number of moves to get here, unless I'm doing something kind of redundant or taking a long path more than necessary, right? So the knight has two ways of reaching a place. It turns out this is also true for the bishop and the rook, which makes the differences between them really interesting. So if I want my bishop to go to a4 as well, c6 to a4, c2 to a4, exactly two ways. If I want this bishop to go to any square on its diagonal, it actually has many ways, but they're all kind of silly. When I was uh, doing this, I was thinking about making some terminology like 
non-recursive ways to reach a certain square. Like if I want to reach f6, I could go all the way to h8 and back, but I thought this was kind of silly. Because in a real game, we'll almost never do something like that. Thank you for the follow, Hopeful Flipper. That's also a great name. Um, so anyway, I'm mostly considering pads that don't go back. You could always overshoot a square, but in a real game, that's just usually not that interesting. Um, so let's talk about the rook. So the rooks, they also have two ways. One, two to reach the square, one, two. So rooks, knights, and bishops, they all have two ways to reach a certain square. The reason that they actually have different strengths is uh, not because of how many options they have, but how they get there. So it's about how they interact with other pieces. So I guess there are two layers to the, the value of a piece. One is how it interacts with the board, like how well it traverses the matrix that we have. And the, the second thing is how it interacts with the other pieces. If we added new pieces to the chess game, it would actually change the value of all the pieces. It's kind of an interesting thing. If you like to play around with chess variants, um, you could definitely add some new pieces and see how it impacts the play. And also changing the size of the, size of the board matters a lot too. For example, if you play this four player chess on chess.com, which has fixed rules, it's actually kind of boring in my opinion. I think it's like the board is just too big for the pawns and the knights to be really that impactful. The most important thing about the king is just that you lose the game when you lose the king in, four, in the four player chess. Um, and for this reason, I think four player chess is way more interesting when you play with house rules with people like in real life, not online. So anyway, moving on. So the queens, they have really tons of ways to go to one place. Uh, maybe we'll just talk about one example. Let's say that the queen wants to go to just one diagonal step like this. It can go in one move, of course, but if we want to talk about its multiple options, here's another way and another way and another way and another. Um, and then there's these uh, recursive map paths where it goes back and then, and then forward and forward then back again. But it already has a ton of ways just to go one square. Imagine if it wants to go across the whole board. Like if I want to go from here to like here, there's probably like a lot more ways. Actually, I didn't think about this one in particular. This one I see one, two, sorry, like this. I guess because it's a little bit too far away, it's not that interesting. But if it was like going from C6, I would be able to go like this and this and this and this. You can see there, there can be many ways for the queen. Many more ways than a knight, bishop, or rook. So the queen has just tons of options and that's part of what gives it its intrinsic strength. No matter what size of chessboard, no matter what pieces are playing in the chess game, the queen is always going to be super strong just because it has so much flexibility to reach a particular square. It's very hard to stop a queen if it wants to reach some spot. This is also why the queen is awesome in three checks. We can usually sacrifice a queen for two checks and then finish them off with minor pieces or a rook just because the queen is super impossible to uh, dissuade from reaching the king. So food for thought, part of the maybe theoretical underpinnings of the other games, uh, the chess variants that is.